Our speaker this evening is Director of Apologetics and Evangelization at Catholic Answers. Tim Staples was raised a Southern Baptist, and although he fell away from the faith of his childhood, he came back to, fi- back to faith in Christ during his late teen years through the witness of Christian televangelists. After his tour of duty with the Marine Corps, Tim enrolled in the Jimmy Swagger Bible College and became a youth minister in an Assembly of God community. During his final year in the Marines, however, Tim met a Marine who really knew his faith and challenged him to study Catholicism from Catholic and historical resources. That encounter sparked a two-year search for the truth, leading to Tim's conversion to the Catholic faith in 1988. He spent the following six years in formation for the priesthood, earning a degree in philosophy from St. Charles Borromeo Seminary in Overbrook, Pennsylvania. He then studied theology on a graduate level at Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland for two years. Realizing that his calling was not to the priesthood, Tim left the seminary in 1994 and has been working in Catholic apologetics and evangelization ever since. Um, I'm, I'm going to share a, a little bit here at the outset, and hopefully we'll, we'll have time for some Q&A. But I'm going to talk about Christ and true happiness, and I'm going to do it in, in three parts. I want to start by going back to the basics. I was talking with my, my kids last night as I was, uh, we always read scripture and have a little Q&A period every night, every night before my kids go to bed. And my, my 12-year-old, Luke, is, uh, he's an aspiring apologist. For those of you who don't know, I have seven kids and three boys and four girls, and they range from 14 down to one. And I kind of quizzed Lukey a little bit on the proofs for the existence of God, which I know you guys got filled up with with Carlo Broussard here recently, and, and there's more to come. But... Um, I asked Luke, I said, Lukey, now I want you to give me one of Thomas's five proofs. Now he's 12 years old, and his favorite one is the second proof for the existence of God. And when he, when he started his little response, he made a statement that really stuck out to me. He said, well, first of all, Dad, everything that we see in creation was created. And so obviously, Dad, creation needs a creator, right? Now, he kind of got away from actually Thomas's proof uh, from cause, but he stated it before, and then I said, yes, but we want to be a little more precise here. We want to start with the fact that everything that exists is caused. And then we reason from there to the uncaused cause, right, Luke? But I, I just, I was taken by his, his simple response to the question by saying, Dad, we see creation, and creation needs a creator. So obviously there has to be a God. Coming from a 12-year-old, I thought that was pretty, pretty powerful. I think when we look at... Romans chapter 1, St. Paul does make a similar, similar, similar argument when he, he basically lays out that the creation does, in fact, have God's fingerprints all over it. This is something, in fact, in Romans chapter 1, St. Paul hits very, very hard, doesn't he, when he talks about how that, number one, the creation demands a creator, and number two, he talks about in particular from Romans 1, verses 21 down to 29. He says, you know, the creation, in fact, demonstrates the existence of the creator. But then he says in verse 21 that if we reject this, that is such an obvious truth, there are ramifications for our lives. And whether that is an individual or a culture, this is what we see in Romans chapter 1. It says in verse 21, although they knew God, they refused to give thanks to him as God and to acknowledge him 
as God. And so what was the result? The result of rejecting this that is so obviously true, right? And we're speaking in our day and age of of skepticism. We have to uh, flesh that out a bit for folks because for a lot of folks, it's not quite as evident anymore. But this is something to St. Paul, this is so obvious the creator demands a creator, and if you reject this both ba- this basic fundamental truth that com- it's written into our very being as human beings that there is a God, there are consequences. And notice what happens is when they refuse to acknowledge God, they begin to turn and to worship the creature rather than the creator, Right? It says, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools, and they begin to worship all manner of four-legged creatures and such, and they descend to the depths leading to, as, you know, Lumen Gentium points out to us uh, and the church throughout her tradition, that homosexual acts often are the result of a rejection of God over some period of time. But the mind becomes darkened, the will becomes weakened, and you, in essence, open yourself up to all sorts of evils. Why? Because you are rejecting something that is so basic to your nature. In fact, I, I say this often, you know, the most natural thing a human being can do is get on his knees and worship God. That is the most natural, the most human thing a person can do because we are, as St. Augustine famously said it, and and we all know it in the very beginning of, of his confessions, right? Thou hast made us for thyself and our hearts are restless until they, they rest in you. This is so profoundly true. We're made for God. And so if, in fact, we reject that for which we are made, and this is something, as you all know, you all know because Carlo told you so, this is something that is knowable just by the pure and natural light of reason, as Vatican Council I teaches us. We can know that we are made for God. I like to do it real simply when I talk to my kids or to, to students you know, when, when we talk about our human nature, we say that we have two principal powers in the human soul, that is to know and to will. I, I often ask my students, I say, let, let me ask you a, a question. Which would be better to know? Um, the cure for cancer or the lyrics to a, who, who are some of the singers today? Uh, Brittany, what's her name? Britney Spears. So you can tell I'm out of touch, <laughs> folks, right? Or the words to a Britney Sears, Spears? Okay, Britney Spears song. Which would be better to know? Now, every student that I've ever talked to gets this right, whether they're in ninth grade or, or in a college student. They will say, well, it'd be better to know the cure for cancer. Well, if it's better to know the cure for cancer than to know the words to a Britney Spears song, what would be the best thing to know, the best truth to know? Well, the best and greatest truth would be the reality of God, the truth of God. And this is what we're ordered to, right? We are ordered to know the ultimate truth. And similarly, I say, when it comes to the will, which is ordered to the good. And say, look, what would it be better to will? Or let's, let's use the, the highest end of the will's power, and that is love. Which would be better to love? Um, your mother or a cherry pie? Which one would it be better to love? And once again, students 100% of the time get it right. Well, if it's better to love your mother than a cherry pie, what would then be the ultimate love toward which your will is ordered? The ultimate good, but God. And so, you know, just using simple reasoning like this, we can 
help folks to see that St. Augustine was right. Yes, our intellects are made to know the ultimate truth, which is God. Our wills are ordered to love the ultimate good, which is God. This is something we can know just through the natural light of reason. Well, my friends, if we do not seek to know and to love the ultimate good, what's going to happen to us is laid out for us in Romans chapter 1. Because although we knew God and we can know God, it's written into our very hearts, as St. Paul would later say in Romans chapter 2, verse 14, the natural law, he says, is written into our very hearts. If we reject this, that is most absolute foundational to who we are as human beings, we will ultimately, because look, we are ordered to know and to love the ultimate truth and ultimate good, which is God. If we choose not to know and love, which, folks, that's a a description of what it means to worship God, to know and to love him. If we choose not to worship him, we will, in fact, worship something. This is going to be a very important principle that we're going to come back to again and again today in that good Augustinian fashion. He's made us for himself, and our hearts will remain restless until they rest in him. If we are made to know and to love him, to worship, if you will, because that's all that worship is, acknowledging the ultimate truth, loving the ultimate good, which is God. If we refuse to do that, we will worship something because that's the way we're made. We will, in fact, seek to know and to love, to worship, Something And St. Paul describes the tendency, and I'm going to argue, uh, guys and girls, this is our tendency down through the ages. Our tendency and our temptation, we're going to talk about Renaissance humanism, we're going to talk about enlightenment, we're going to talk reformation, but we're also going to talk about our own Catholic culture and our own tendencies as individuals. This is our temptation, my friends, is to turn from the creator and to begin to make things, people, power, money, sex, you name it. We tend to turn these things into God. And sometimes it can be so subtle. We can begin to worship the creature, the creator, or rather than the creator, and it will result in, in our demise, either as individuals or as cultures, it will result in our demise. That's kind of a, a little foundation here for where we want to go in, this, uh, in, in these next about 45 minutes here before we have some questions and answers. So here's, here's where I want to start. With this as a foundation, understanding that we are made to know and to love the ultimate truth and the ultimate good. If we choose not to, we will in fact begin to worship something, whether it be money, sex, power, you name it, we will begin to worship something. I want to talk a little bit about Renaissance humanism. Now I know you guys have been studying Uh, the Renaissance, and so I'm not going to share with you anything that's new, but perhaps I might share something a little bit new when it comes to applying what you guys are learning this this quarter. As you know, when we talk about Renaissance, Renaissance humanism, we're talking about a movement that most would acknowledge begins in the 13th century, moves through the 14th, 15th, into the 16th century, And, you know, I want to be careful here because, as you know, when we talk about Renaissance humanism, we're talking about a wide range of ideas that come under this this one category, some of which are good. As you know, we have popes who are considered, you know, leaders of the humanist movement from Pius XII to even Pope Leo X and other popes. Um... So there is a a very good aspect to Renaissance humanism, but unfortunately, just as we talked about from the beginning, the tendency, our tendency, is to take things that are good 
and we can easily move into extremes to one direction or the other and quickly find ourselves off track beginning to distort essential truths of who we are and who God is. And I would argue this is what happened uh, in, uh, in and during the Renaissance, in particular with regard to humanism. Now, as many of you know, you know, St. Thomas More was one of the great humanists, but so were, you know, in the latter end of the Renaissance human, humanist movement, you had reformers, some Catholics like Erasmus, a classic uh, uh, humanist, but you also had William Tyndale and you had Ulrich Zwingli that were humanists as well. Who, who definitely got off track. So what happened? Well, I, I think I'm probably going to oversimplify in the short time that we have here, at least to some degree. But as many, I want to point out a couple of, of key facts in the, that kind of sparked the humanist movement, became some of its strengths, which also became some of its weaknesses. As many of you know, there was during the, this great movement of Renaissance humanism, a rediscovery of some ancient works. And part of the humanist movement was a sort of return back to classical literature, some of which, as I said, was rediscovered. For example, Epicurus uh, and his hedonistic principle, right, which, you know, a lot of folks misrepresent his hedonistic principle is not like the hedonism we know in the 21st century, but his pleasure principle that man ultimately seeks pleasure in order to get to happiness. Pleasure is the ultimate principle. And, and I would argue, of course, this is a little bit off track, but we had Christian writers like Lucretius, one of the very early Christian writers who attempted to Christianize Epicurus kind of disappeared for centuries, came back, and this became uh, re reinvigorated, this idea of Christianizing ancient philosophers. And that, it's not like that's anything new. We have, you know, Platonism, we have Aristotelianism that are deeply rooted in our, our Catholic tradition. But the problem is, you know, just for a moment here, when we talk about Epicureanism and the, the hedonistic principle, which perhaps I could, I could lay it out in the story maybe some of you have read about Epicurus himself when he was dying, sort, sort of to lay out Epicurus' uh, uh, hedonistic principle. When he was dying of a malady that was evidently very painful, he said the way to overcome this pain was to simply ignore it and to think back to pleasurable times that he had, the happiness that he had in his life, and that's what helped to, to get him through the suffering that would eventually lead to his death, right? And we, we can see how, you know, there is a sense in which the human person, in a very good way, desires pleasure. And again, Epicurus is, is not talking about, a, 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 a what's his name, Hugh Hefner sort of hedonistic principle, because as you know, Epicurus taught that there are pleasures to excess that will actually not bring happiness at all, but we have to moderate, we have to eliminate unnecessary pleasures, pleasures that we go after that ultimately will not lead to our happiness. But the principle is that pleasure is the end toward which man is ordered. And so when you experience serious pain in your life, what do you do? Well, that flies in the face of the principle, so we have to basically ignore it. Think back to pleasurable stuff you've experienced. Now, of course, that principle right there cannot be Christianized, and I know some would take Hebrews chapter 12 concerning our Lord, where the scripture says, verses 1 and 2, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, to say that, see, here Jesus for, you know, he endured the cross. How? By focusing on the joy that was before him. Actually, that's not what the text says. The fact is, Jesus at all times beheld his father's face in the beatific vision. So no doubt, for the, the joy of the Lord 
was flooding his very being over, even though he chose not to allow it to be manifested in his lower nature, certainly at the time of the passion uh, of our Lord. But it wasn't as though Jesus was ignoring the pain. No, he actually embraced the cross and he calls us, hear me folks, are we awake? And he calls us to embrace the cross as well in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. He says, unless you take up your cross daily and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. So there's no pleasure principle here, hedonistic principle here, because ultimately we are ordered toward the ultimate truth and the ultimate good in spite of what we may feel, whether it is joy or pain, Whatever the emotional experience may be, we must be ordered toward the true, the good, and the beautiful. Are you all with me? And so you can easily see how we can get off track by trying to Christianize this Epicurean principle as, you know, Lucretius did. And again, I, 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 I knew in making this presentation, it's so easy to oversimplify because you do have great Christians like Lucretius, who is a much better Christian than, than I am. And uh, I would aspire to be the great writer that, that he was. But there are certain aspects. Here's the, the point, folks. There are certain aspects whenever we are seeking to Christianize, whether it's Aristotle or uh, Plato or Socrates, here, Epicurus, we have to be very careful because our tendency as human beings is to take this, which is, and, and let's face it, there's a lot of truth in this uh, hedonistic principle. Yes, we are ordered toward ultimately the pleasure and the joy that we will experience in the beatific vision and that we experience in this life as well by living moderately, virtuously in this life. We do experience pleasure. But how you get off track here is when you make pleasure the principle. See, and this this is what happens in this sort of Christian humanistic movement in the 13th, 14th, 15th, and even into the 16th century that, by the way, I would argue really takes flight when the Reformation happens And then we have the so-called enlightenment, which was not enlightenment at all, that sort of joins forces and brings about what I I would say is ultimately our demise as a culture and a civilization. We see the problem in seed form here. And here is the problem. The problem is this, this Christian humanism, if it you know were to simply espouse, you know, in the words of the great Saint Irenaeus. This is the glory of God, right? Man fully alive. That's fine. Human nature that finds its fulfillment in the living God, transformed in Jesus Christ, is in fact the glory of God. But what can happen, folks, so easily is to get turned away from that, and the focus becomes more on human, the human and human nature, and God get. are you following me? God gets pushed to the side. This is what happens in the Christian humanist movement of the Renaissance period. There's a lot of wonderful literature that comes out of this, a lot of wonderful art focusing on the beauty and glory of man, but it's so easy to get moved toward an emphasis on the human that pushes God to the side. We see this also in... Uh, uh, a a revival of other literature as well, ancient literature, that tended toward taking these ancient uh, writings, whether it's Plotinus, the Neoplatonists, and others, and sort of attempting to baptize them, but in the process, not not completing the process of getting rid of all of the bad when you baptize these sorts of principles. And it led to all sorts of things. I think I'm maybe focusing on this a a little bit too much, but I do think it's important that we see that, you know, for example, the Renaissance Neoplatonists who attempted to reconcile uh, Neoplatonism, and again, particularly Plotinus, 
Um, and here you have other great Christian writers like St. Augustine, Lactantius, another great Christian writer who were very much uh, in the, the Neoplatonistic school, and, and that's fine. However, you know, Plotinus's idea of emanation and ultimately pantheism is a problem, right? We also have a, a problem with, you know, what's called Hermeticism, which, which takes another ancient writer and ends up creating a sort of indifferentism that sees the good in all of the ancient classical works, which, you know, say Thomas More would have been saying amen to this. Absolutely, there is good. There's truth and beauty and goodness. You read Cicero, my goodness, you read Virgil, and sometimes you, you think you're writing, you're reading an inspired author. It's so beautiful. But again, we have to be careful because what comes out of these emphases of, of you know, revitalizing the classics, Neoplatonism, Hermeticism, which becomes indifferentism, um, is, is just that. What, what begins to happen, my friends, is man becomes, he starts to be moved into the center instead of God being in the center. I would argue that this, this ancient tendency that we have, and here's, here's my problem ultimately with the excesses of you know the humanism of the Renaissance period, it moves into the direction of exalting the individual to such a point that it leads to men, you know, like Tyndale, Zwingli, who see themselves as individuals not bound by, you know, the common good, not bound by what God has revealed to us concerning his church, the parameters within which we must remain, it's easy to begin to go beyond and to focus on me, focus on man, another emphasis in the Renaissance period, personal freedom which would become, you know, one of the linchpins later for the French Revolution and all the atrocities that would happen there. You know, liberty, um, equality, fraternity, great, right? But the problem is when you leave God behind, you end with Robespierre and the slaughter of untold thousands of Catholics, priests, nuns, and so forth. So this again, is the tendency. This is what happens when we begin to focus, our focus becomes on man rather than God and rather than seeing man as created by God and for God and in absolute need of God, God begins to be pushed to the side, you see? And, and so this ultimately becomes the problem with, uh, you know, that period of the Renaissance and the humanism as good as it was in many respects, when man begins to become the measure rather than God, we are in big trouble, which leads me to uh, the, the second component or the second point that I'd like to make. Um, when we talk about happiness, in order for man to be happy, as you know, I said earlier, St. Augustine says it so well, he must understand that we have been made for God. Our hearts, therefore, will be restless until they rest in God because that is, in fact, how we were made, how we are now ordered toward God to know him and to love him. But in the context of the gospel of Jesus Christ, this message becomes all the more profound because of the incarnation. This radical, you know, unthinkable to the Jewish mind and even to the ancient pagan mind that God would become man. God knows us. God loves us as as. The Gospel of John puts it so beautifully in John 3, 16, for God 
so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I think we would all say amen to this point right now, that God made us and therefore God knows us. Amen? Would you all say amen to that? God knows precisely who we are. In fact, he knows us better than we knows us. He knows what we need, what will fulfill us, and ultimately what will make us happy. We've already talked about how knowing God and loving God ultimately is the way to happiness, not pleasure, not money, not power. Ultimately, it's to know and to love God that is ultimately our happiness. This is the way we're made. But God knows that. He knows us because he made us. And so God made a way for us to experience a level of happiness. As I said before, it's beyond anything the human mind could have fathomed before the incarnation in the incarnation. And this, the catechism of the Catholic Church tells us in paragraph 643 is a matter of history, that God really did so love the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. As a matter of history, God chose to enter into our history when the word was made flesh and dwelt among us so that we could experience what we already know. Our hearts are already restless and they will remain restless until they rest in God. God makes the way for us to experience that fulfillment for which he created us in a manner beyond our wildest dreams. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In fact, St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, talks about how that this concept of the incarnation, right, is foolishness to the Greeks. And it's a stumbling block for the Jews. Why is that? Because to Greek philosophers, folks, it's impossible for God to become, right? How can God become anything? He is pure actuality. He is pure act. God can't become, that is ludicrous as far as the Greeks are concerned. And I will tell you, from a philosophical perspective, that one has uh, caused us to spill a lot of ink over the centuries in defending the incarnation. And you, uh, you all understand, in fact, I just wrote a blog post for Catholic Answers recently, in the incarnation, did God change? And of course, the answer is no. Because the only change that happened in the incarnation was to to humanity, not to divinity. And that there's a simple answer to something that would that would be the subject matter for a whole nother talk. The fact is though, God did become man in the sense that now human nature in Jesus Christ has as its subject a divine person. And and this revolutionizes all of creation and opens up to us a future beyond anything we could have fathomed before. But in order for us to attain to this that God has called us to, folks, God, we, we need to understand first and foremost that when Jesus, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, became man, Can you imagine walking 2,000 years ago, being able to walk up to a man who on the surface looks no different than any other dude walking down the streets of Jerusalem, Nazareth, Bethlehem, but you're talking to Almighty God. Jesus taught in such ways about how we are to experience happiness. Jesus opened a door for us to experience happiness in a degree we could not have fathomed before when he says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Jesus opens a door for us so radical that he could say in John chapter 14, verse 12 of of believers in Christ, he says, you will do greater things even than I have done. Jesus 
is for us in the incarnation our way to ultimate happiness, to ultimate fulfillment, because he is the God toward whom we are ordered to know and to love, manifest in the flesh. And so he becomes for us the only way to ultimate happiness. But here's where the problem starts, folks. Because I'm going to argue, my friends, that the tendencies that we talked about when we talked about in, you know, with the humanism of the Renaissance, of moving man into the middle and kicking God out, happen over and over in post-Christian times and really culminate during the Reformation and then the Enlightenment where even at times Christians, in the, even in the name of Christ, or certainly theists in the name of God, kick God to the side and man becomes the measure. And let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. Let's consider at the tail end of the Renaissance where we experience the Reformation, where some of these that I mentioned before Christian humanists become, begin to emphasize the human to the exclusion of divine authority. Man becomes the measure. This lends itself to the casting off of authority. Hey, I'm the dude. I know the truth. And it leads to the men like Zwingli, like Tyndale, who ultimately, and this I would argue is the ultimate principle of the Protestant rebellion, the Protestant rebellion sort of, I would argue, succumbs to the worst form of humanism that puts me in charge over God's authority. You say, well, wait a minute. That's not John Calvin. That's not Martin Luther. I mean, they're all about submission to God. And absolutely, they are. In the abstract, yes, we worship God, absolutely. God is the first cause of our salvation. No works. We acknowledge God. That is true. But in fact, the Reformation becomes, and I know as a child of the Reformation, ultimately one of the things that brought me to the Catholic faith, my friends, was, and I will, I will never forget, folks, years ago, when... Those of you who've heard my story, you know Sergeant Matt Dula, my Marine buddy, who challenged me. He was the first Catholic I'd ever met who really was ready, willing, and able to present his, to really defend intellectually, morally, his Catholic faith, and he did. But I remember, you know, Mother Teresa makes the statement, and I forget which book it was, where Mother Teresa talks about, it might have been words to love by, as I recall, I think it was, where Mother Teresa said, when I and my sisters are out ministering to the poorest of the poor, she said, often the first response of the poorest of the poor, when they encounter Jesus in us, their first impulse, their first response is to become better Hindus, better Muslims, better whatever it is they are. And if you recall, mother got hammered for that. You know, some uh, said, you know, that, that's blasphemy. What are you talking about? When you encounter Jesus, you become a better Hindu? What is this, indifferentism? No, it's not indifferentism. It's common sense. That's exactly what happened to me when I encountered Jesus Christ in my buddy, Matt Dula, the first Response. My first response was to become a better Protestant because he challenged me to the core of my Protestant beliefs. So what do I do? I turn to what I know. And so I began to study Martin Luther. I'd never really studied Luther before until I had been challenged by a Catholic. I'd never read John Calvin before until I'd been challenged by a Catholic. I had never read John Wesley before until I was challenged by a Catholic. But I began to study these men, these were the reformers. And what I discovered, I want you to hear me, folks. My goodness, if I was Pentecostal, I'd be shouting right now, because this, this is a really important point right now. What I discovered ultimately is I was reading Luther and Calvin and Knox and Zwingli and later Wesley. 
I even read some Charles Finney and some of the more, you know, the, the later uh, Sons of the Rebellion, popularly called the Reformation, right? But what I found is ultimately everything depended on me. I was, you know, and when my buddy Matt Dula challenged me with Catholic authors, I did begin to read St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, Bits and Pieces. I'm reading Catholic councils, ecumenical councils. I started reading, you know, books that my buddy gave me, like Ludwig, Ludwig Ott's Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma, which he gave me. I began to read it and study it. The church teaches by the Jesuit fathers of St. Mary's, the Apostolic Fathers, Lightfoot, you name it. I start pouring through these things. And here, here, I found myself in this very uncomfortable position of saying this. I'm looking at, and, and again, this is, this is that tendency. I, I, I feebly laid it out in, in my, my first uh, section with you guys. The, the problem it, during the period of the Renaissance in taking this author and this author, and let's, let's take a look at Plotinus again and Epicurus. We're going to look at these ancient documents. And the tendency is for us to be so proud of how, look, oh, yeah, we can Christianize this and Christianize this and Christianize this. We begin to lose our moorings, and what we find is we get pushed into the center and God gets pushed to the side. And that's exactly what happened, I'm telling you, I experienced when I'm, I'm reading Thomas Aquinas, right? The greatest minds, perhaps, since the apostles. I mean, Jerome and Augustine are up there too, but my goodness, Thomas Aquinas. And, and, and I'm reading Augustine. I'm reading various fathers of the church, especially the, the apostolic fathers. I read them all. I'm pouring through them, right? But here, here where, this is where I found myself. Me, knucklehead Tim Staples, is saying, you know what, Thomas Aquinas is good here, but man, he's wrong here. Hey, Calvin's good here, but man, he's nuts here. Luther's good here, but oh, man, he's nuts here. And on and on we go. Finney, ah, makes good points here. Who is ultimately in charge of things, folks? Amen. Me. My friends, this is the age-old tendency that goes back to the Garden of Eden, my friends. Right? What did the devil tempt Adam and Eve? Did God say you would? Oh, God knows. You partake of that fruit. <laughs> you will be like him. And of course, God already promised. He'd already made them his image and likeness. The temptation ultimately was to uh, be like him without him. This is our tendency is to want to do it our way. This is where we went wrong in the Renaissance. This is where, and, and I believe in seed form, are you with me? Leads us toward, and, and why some of the great humanists became sons and daughters of the rebellion is because man begins to be put into the center and God just kind of gets kicked to the side. My friends, that's exactly, I, I remember the moment when, when it hit me, I mean, I don't remember everything that I was reading at the time, but I remember the moment when it hit me. I said, who in the world am I? Who in the world? I am a knucklehead. I, John Calvin, are you kidding? These uh, incredible mind. Yeah, he was crazy on a number of things. <laughs> Would you read Calvin if you accept his first principles, man? He's really systematic. He makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, these great minds from Calvin and on back, Thomas Aquinas, Augustine, and I am going to be the arbiter of truth? Are you kidding me? Thanks be to God, Jesus Christ in the incarnation did something, my friends, that would eliminate this problem of you and I putting ourselves in the center and kicking God to the side, because one of the most important things that Jesus Christ did when he came to this earth is he established a church to which he gave his authority to speak for him. So radical was this authority that in Luke 10, 16, he says, if they receive you, they receive me. 
In Matthew 10, 40, if they hear you, they hear me. If they reject you, they reject me. If you, they reject me, they reject my Father. Jesus gave us a church. This is one of the central things that Jesus Christ did, purposes for which he came to the earth. Of course, to reveal God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Of course, to suffer and die for our sins. Absolutely. But he also came to establish a church so that we can know the ultimate truth and the ultimate good, my friends. And we can know it with facility, with certainty, as St. Thomas Aquinas says, and without the admixture of error. But let me get back to what happens in the Protestant rebellion. Rooted, I would argue, in this tendency in Catholic culture to, to exalt the individual to the exclusion of the common good, and that would be put on steroids in the Reformation and later in the Enlightenment with the insanity of men like you know, Hobbes, and we could go through all of the Enlightenment thinkers who went to, to you know, such extremes to where, you know, the individual, as I say with Hobbes, you know, with uh, his philosophy, it's right that makes right, right? Everything's based on human rights. There's no obligation to the common good whatsoever. Why? I mean, to me, Hobbes is the end of the road when we talk about the, the humanistic movement that that went astray and begins to put man as such a focus that man becomes the measure, he becomes the center, and that will go beyond what I want to do right now. We can talk about John Locke as well, who uh, I think ultimately uh, falls to the the same difficulty, though he does try to get things a little bit back on track. He's still still way off. But this this leads me, folks, to the final point I want to make before we do some some Q&A. And that is, you know, we can see how historically in a movement that was in in many ways a great movement in the Renaissance, humanist movement, beginning in the 13th century, 14th, 15th, into the 16th century. Like I said, a lot of good came out of it, a lot of good artwork, and a lot of good and great men and women, you know, that were good sons and daughters of the church. But it's so easy to just go astray and to just ebb man into the middle and push God to the side. It, it's not so much you, you kick God all the way to the curb, you know, as the extreme, you know, of a David Hume. But you move God off of the throne and you place man instead which is ultimately, and in a subtle way, I, I believe what happened in the Reformation, and of course it becomes, in the French Revelation, re, you know, uh, Revolution, we see it, you know, explode onto the scene, and into the 19th and 20th centuries, we see the result. This is what happens when man becomes the measure. The, the unheard of carnage of World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the wars of the 20th century that reached a scale that the ancient people in, in the 13th century under the great St. Louis the Ninth could not have even been imagined happened in the 20th century. That's what happens ultimately when man becomes the measure. But I want to I move to one final point, and that is I'd like to challenge us a little bit when it comes to our own Catholic culture, is it possible, folks? Should you and I, as good Catholics, come on, we're all sons and daughters of the church, aren't we? I mean, hey, I work for Catholic Answers, man, right? I'm a good Catholic. Is there something for me to be careful of when we think back of the lessons of the humanism of the Renaissance, the Protestant rebellion, the Enlightenment, which we've just barely scratched the surface of, I would argue yes, because the same tendency that was there in the Garden of Eden (laughs) was there in the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Enlightenment is with us today. And it's so easy. Now I'm going to do something that, so you know, one or two of you might get mad at me, but that's okay. We'll talk about it. Uh, Folks get mad at me. That's okay. 
but let's talk about it. I want to talk about how that in our Catholic culture today, in many ways, we see movements that have a tendency to fall prey to the same principle where man becomes pushed to the center. I'm not going to get into detail liturgically. Are you kidding me? Right? Look what happened in the post conciliar reform of the liturgy. Can it, I mean, folks, if we're going to be honest, we're going to acknowledge, look, I love Vatican Council too. I've read all 16 documents. Those of you that read our blog at Catholic Answers, you know I defend the church. We do at Catholic Answers, absolutely. But let's just say the reform got a little bit off track after Vatican Council too. Am I going out on a limb and saying that, folks? I mean, we have liturgies today that are so absolutely man-centered. My wife and I, just uh, for Mother's Day last week, We went up to visit her mom, and we went to a a parish that shall be nameless that we had never gone to before. And we experienced a liturgy. I mean, it was complete with, you know, bringing all the kids up on the altar. Father was helping the liturgy along at every step of the way. I mean, from right up to and including the words of institution, my friends. Obviously, the liturgy needed his help, right? And I I say that tongue-in-cheek. Of course not. See, my friends, we have movements in the church that have tended to make man the center, even in penetrating into the holiest place, our worship in our Catholic culture. We have liturgies designedly, the flying saucer churches. Does anybody else see this, my friends, where we're looking at each other during Mass instead of our Lord? We have liturgies that are so man-centered, and it's so easy to get there. Now, it begins with liturgy, but of course, theologically as well. We have movement after movement in the church. And I don't think I have time to do all the ones I wanted. Maybe we we can talk a little bit during the Q&A. But let me just toss out, I mean, I wanted to talk a little bit about centering prayer, some of the New Age stuff that we find in our church that it, it's, it's disguised well, but in the end, my friends, it becomes man being placed in the center and God being pushed to the side, and it is extremely dangerous. See, folks, I argue that when we talk about this movement, that in a certain sense, it, its seeds were seen in the Renaissance, explodes in the Protestant Rebellion, and then in the Enlightenment, I I see in this, my friends, the work of the devil. And I don't know how you can explain it as anything else, because this at its core is demonic, right? The, the, The idea of moving God to the side, this is exactly what St. Paul is talking about in Romans chapter one, that ultimately leads to the demise of it. Look, any individual, any family, any culture that pushes God to the side. And it, and it doesn't have to be, my friends, your you know, horns coming up out of your head and, and worshiping Satan. Amen? But it can be very subtle, and it often is. Moving God ever so gently to the side, and I become the center. This is a dangerous place to be. Let me toss out this one, and, and I will... Uh, conclude my remarks, and and I'm looking forward to the questions and answers, because that's always my favorite part. Now, I want to do this gently, because I I, I know some folks aren't going to like the first part of it, but let, let let me just put it this way. How many of you have ever heard, and it's everywhere in Catholic culture, I hear it, that God wants us to be the best version of ourselves? Anybody heard that one? Oh, I know, and some of you are already saying, what is he doing? What is he doing? In fact, I heard one of the the great purveyors of this movement, who is actually a friend of mine, um, and and a a son of the church, a a wonderful man, who was recently on a Catholic radio station, and and he, he said this, oh, Lord, help us. He said, you know what we need in our lives at time? You need to just... Take a longer and hot shower. Indulge yourself, he said, right? 
in the name of this, you know, being the best version of yourself. He actually said, indulge yourself. You know, when, when he said that on a local Catholic radio station here in Southern California, I was listening and I said, oh my, but, and I knew I had to have a, a, a conversation with him a, after he said that. You know, I just, I don't remember where Jesus said that part. You know, in order for us to be helped spiritually, it, I, I remember him saying, unless you take up your cross daily, unless you deny yourself, amen, and take up your cross, you cannot be my disciple. I, I remember that. But I don't remember the part where Jesus said, unless you indulge yourself, take, and, and again, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm not even telling you who he is. So be quiet. Uh, but he said, eat that extra helping of pasta. Take that longer hot shower. Indulge yourself. My friends, that is that. Look, do we do these things? Absolutely we do. <laughs> yes, we do. But my friends, we don't want to spiritualize these things to the point where this becomes how you become the best version of yourself. You see, my friends, ultimately we have to understand that when we push God out even slightly, and move ourselves into the center, we lose the very reality that we need for happiness. Because in everything that we've said here, folks, our happiness comes from ultimately our union with the ultimate truth, the ultimate beauty, the ultimate goodness, who is God himself. Ultimately, happiness comes first and foremost, by a supernatural power that is outside of myself. I am completely impotent when it comes to bringing happiness to myself, my friends. My happiness is rooted in a relationship with the eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is the second person of the Blessed Trinity, was incarnate, 2,000 years ago, established a church and a sacramental order whereby that supernatural life comes to me. And hear me, I don't want to be the best version of myself. I don't want to be. You know why? Because the best version of myself will get me to hell. That's about as good as it will, will get. What gets me to heaven is to be like Jesus to be a partaker of the divine nature, to go beyond what the best version of myself could ever be. Are y'all with me? Now, I know as my, my friend who made those statements on our local Catholic radio station would say, Tim, I agree with you. Absolutely, we need the grace of God. I just say, be careful. Be careful in what you say. Be careful when you get involved in various movements. And we don't have time to do the centering prayer thing that I wanted to do, I don't think. But be careful, because some of these movements and ideas, when they kick God off the throne, here's a, here's a red flag, and you become the center. It becomes about you turning in on yourself, indulging yourself, rather than acknowledging that I am a sinner who is in desperate need of grace, because my, my Lord and my God, when I was baptized, I got in over my head. I got involved with something that I cannot accomplish. That is, my calling is to get to heaven, which is ultimate happiness, the beatific vision, happiness, the possession of God intellectually to the degree of the gift of grace and my merits at the moment of my death. Please be God. I die in a state of, of grace. I will possess God in the beatific vision, and that is ultimate happiness. My friends, even in the beatific vision, the feelings and everything, the exaltation that will come is ancillary to that first truth, the knowledge of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that comes by a gift of absolute grace. And this is why I say I don't want to be the best version of myself. I want to be like Jesus. In fact, I want to be Jesus. I want to be what 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, St. Peter says, we have been made partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. 
That is the only way to happiness. Because look, folks, there's all kinds of what St. Paul or the inspired author of Hebrews describes it in Hebrews 12 as the pleasures of sin for a season. Amen? You know, there's a counterfeit pleasure, amen, that comes from sin. There's a counterfeit pleasure. In fact, there's a counterfeit peace. Didn't Jesus say he came to give us peace? Not as the world gives. Do you know there's a peace that the world gives? Amen? But it's a counterfeit peace. It's not a lasting peace that comes via supernatural grace. We have been given a great gift, my Catholic friends. And I'm not ashamed to say it. Our happiness, our peace, will come only through the knowledge, the ex- and not just intellectual knowledge. When St. Peter talks about, in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, having escaped the pollutions that are in the world through lust, through this knowledge, it's epi, epigenoske. It is not just an intellectual knowledge, but an experiential knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that comes through baptism and through the sacraments, where we experience, even in this life, yes, the Epicureans had a point, amen? There is an experience of pleasure in this life, but it simply just cannot be the end toward which we are moving, the goal that we are seeking, because ultimately that pleasure comes ancillary to the possession of God. And that's why St. Peter will tell us that it's through the knowledge, the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we experience this reality, this great gift of being partakers of divine nature. I'm going to leave you with this last thought here, guys and girls, and then you can skewer me if you want. All right. You know, we live in, you know, in a, in a sense, maybe, maybe it's not just our age, but in all ages. Isn't there a tendency among us? We certainly see this at Catholic Answers, a tendency to be minimalists. What do I mean by that? I cannot tell you how many times at Catholic Answers we are asked the question, what is the minimum I have to do? (laughs) You ever get that question, right? What is it? Can you give me, how about this one, guys? Give me a list of mortal sins. I want a complete list so I can not do those things. You ever get that? Now, of course, it's impossible to give a list of mortal sins because of, you know, I mean, for some people, if you're an alcoholic, right? It would be grave matter for you to drink a beer. It's not, thanks be to God, for me. Uh, I love my wine and I love my beer. But for somebody that's an alcoholic, that could be grave matter. I mean, there's no such thing as this list, amen? Although I always like to tell folks, there's no mortal sin that's, a, that's top secret and nobody knows about it, amen? <laughs> so in your life, when you experience anything that you experience, you can know whether this is grave matter or not, but we simply cannot give you an exhaustive list. But what I see behind it is the same tendency, isn't it, guys? The same tendency that you find when the people come to Jesus. How many times do the Pharisees and Sadducees and such, even the rich young man, right? What must I do to get to heaven? What about this situation, Jesus, when he's mediating an argument between the Pharisees and the Sadducees? It often will get down to, what do I have to do? Let, let, let's just use the rich young man here. There are lots of examples in, in the New Testament, but I love that rich young man in Matthew nineteen sixteen. What must I do to get to heaven? And don't you know, Jesus proves beyond a shadow of a doubt He had never been to a Billy Graham crusade. Did y'all ever notice that? He never been. You know how I know? Because he didn't say, oh, just accept me as your personal Lord and Savior, and you're going to heaven. That's not what he said. He said, if you want to enter into life, what? Keep the commandments. Man, that sounds Catholic, doesn't it? But you know what? This young man was the minimalist. He was, as so many of us are, we want to know what is the minimum I have to do to get into heaven, right? And what does Jesus say? One thing thou lackest. When he says, I've done all this from time I'm a kid. One thing you lack, give everything, follow me. 
and the boy walks away sad. Amen. And by the way, folks, as, as you'll read in some commentaries, uh, they will say that, oh, it, it wasn't that this man, you know, was rejecting Jesus as far as walking in union with God. He was simply rejecting the call to perfection that comes in religious life or to the priesthood. You know what, folks? That is hogwash. There's not, as you, you, you read from the, the great St. Jose Maria Escrivá, if there's one thing he left to the church, it is the understanding that we are all called in, in the same way to the same holiness. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And Matthew 5, 48 is not for priests and nuns only. Amen? He called him to perfection just as he calls all of us to perfection. And that young man walked away because it was daunting. And see, this is what we need to understand for all of our minimalist friends here who want to seek to know what is the minimum that I have to do. Jesus says, this is the minimum. Give everything and follow me. In fact, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, there's two verses I like to say that really summarize how we attain happiness in the teachings of Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. And that's Matthew 6, 33 and Matthew 5, 20. Write those down. Matthew 6, 33 and Matthew 5, 20, because this is it. In Matthew 6, 33, you know it. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things you have need of will be added unto you. What we do often in our lives is we seek to add all these things unto ourselves first, and then maybe we'll seek the kingdom of God. Are you with me, folks? Amen. We get it backwards, and there's no way to peace. There's no way ultimately to heaven if we walk that way. Because Jesus said we have to seek first. And this is why we need to go to confession regularly. I don't know about you. I went today. I love, thank you, Father Soroki. He, they have confession every Sunday before Mass. Thanks be to God. <laughs> I, I love going. I have an absolutely wonderful pastor. But the bottom line is, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Right? Number one point. His righteousness. And why is that? Because ultimately, my friends, we're going to tie back, hopefully, into everything we talked about when we say this. Jesus commands us. He gives us a commandment, a new commandment in John chapter 15, verse 12, repeats it in John chapter 13, verse 34. If you want to know the secret of, to happiness, he says this. This is the answer. This is how you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Love one another as I have loved you. A new commandment I give you. What's new about that? Everything. Because my friends, the best version of myself can't do that. Amen? The best version of myself cannot love my neighbor as Jesus loves my neighbor. Because in order to do that, I need supernatural power to go beyond what my nature can accomplish. And this is what leads me. I'm sorry, I, I've, been, I've been ending this for a while now, but go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, and this is the other verse in the Sermon on the Mount that answers the question, how are we going to be happy? How can we attain to peace? It is not by moving God ever so slightly to the side and placing ourselves in the middle. Amen? That's not the way to happiness, that's not the way to peace, and that is not the way to salvation. Under whatever form it is, whether it's Christian humanism taken to an extreme, whether it's the Protestant rebellion, whether it's enlightenment thinking that makes man the measure of all things, or our own theologies and creations that we create in our modern Catholic culture that ultimately puts God to the side and puts us in the center. Amen? Matthew, I'm going to leave you with this. And this time I promise I'm actually leaving. <laughs> and we'll do the, the Q&A. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Powerful line. We could spend an hour on it. Jesus says in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. 
what in the world was Jesus saying? You know what? I, I, I have to mention this too. Let, can we, let me just put that on hold just for a second. Okay. Just for a second. And, and, and we'll, we'll get back to Matthew five twenty. because remember, remember when I, I said there are lots of folks who, who say concerning the rich young man, they say that, well, you know, he, he wasn't saying that this guy, you know, it wasn't that the guy left Jesus altogether. He just left the call to perfection, which I argue is one and the same thing. Amen. All right. That's, that's by, by Catholic teaching. All right. But here, here we go. How do you know that's not true? Well, number one, if you remember, after Jesus puts the hammer down on the rich young man, Matthew 19, 16 and following, uh, it says, you lack one thing, give everything, come and follow me. And, and he walks away. That was the sort of occasion for Jesus then to teach how hard it is for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of heaven. Remember that in Matthew chapter 19? Surely I say to you, it is as impossible for a rich man to enter into to the kingdom of heaven as it is for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle, right? I kid you not, years ago, I remember reading a, a Protestant commentary and, and it eluded me. I tried to find it. I can't remember where it was. Maybe some of you will recognize this. There are actually commentaries that say that, well, actually what Jesus is saying there is it's not that he's saying it's impossible because actually there was a gate in ancient Jerusalem <laughs> called the eye of the needle. And if camels could get down on their knees, it was very difficult, but they could get down on their knees and just make it through the gate. He's not saying it's impossible, but he's saying it's very difficult. Oh my gosh, is that the classic example? Folks, do you see what I'm talking about? Where we say, no, he can't be calling us to perfection, right? So let's create something to make it a little bit easier. Well, it's not really, it's just really difficult. No, the point is that commentary missed the whole boat. You miss the whole boat of Jesus' teaching when you go that way. Because Jesus' whole point to that rich young man and his whole point in the Sermon on the Mount and his calling us to follow him is to point out to us that he's calling us to accomplish the impossible. That's the point. This is why I said when we're baptized, we get in over our heads. Why? Because we're called to get somewhere we can't get without supernatural power. It's impossible. That's the point. It's impossible until you surrender. And give your life completely to God. Put him on the throne because that's where peace comes from. That's where ultimate happiness comes from. When we surrender ourselves completely, this is why Jesus was so radical in his call when he called people to follow him. You know, the man who comes in in Luke chapter 9, what, verse 57 through 62, and says, Lord, I want to follow you. And Jesus says, oh, yeah? Foxes have holes, birds have nests. The Son of Man doesn't even have a place to put his head. In other words, are you sure you want to follow me? Right? I mean, Jesus obviously never read the book How to Win Friends and Influence People because you don't talk to people that way. A man wants to follow you, and you're going to say, right? In, in other words, I don't have a place to rest my head. You follow me the same way to you. Are you sure you want to follow? I mean, it was none of this. Okay, well, let's just sit down, and we'll pray the the sinner's prayer, and we'll get you your tithing envelopes. Amen? <laughs> yes, as I did as Protestant minister. I'm kind of joking. It's okay. You can laugh. All right. But anyway, the point is, another man comes and says, Lord, I want to follow you. But first, let me go bury my father. Let the dead bury the dead. You come and follow me. Oh, my goodness. And, of course, this is an allusion back to Elisha, who when he was called to follow Elijah, he said, let me first go back. And, of course, Elijah let him go back to his family to say his farewells. Jesus is basically saying there's a greater than Elijah here. In fact, he is almighty God who demands absolute obedience because of the fact that he's God. Let the dead bury their dead. You come and follow me. Another man, I want to follow you. But first, 
can I go and say bye to the folks at the house? No man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the king. This is the call of Jesus Christ because he is the God man who calls us to absolute surrender. And finally, Matthew 5, 20, you thought I forgot about it. Unless your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. What is he talking about? Folks, you all know the Pharisees were meticulous about keeping every jot and tittle of the law. And what Jesus is saying in a most profound way is that that will not get you to heaven. Why? Because your righteousness must not only exceed that of the Pharisees, but what did he say in Matthew 6, 33? Same sermon. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And what? His righteousness. Why? So that you can love one another. And I would add love God as Jesus does. Supernatural power. My Catholic friends, my Christian friends, men and women of goodwill, we are called as a supernatural people to be supernatural people, to acknowledge our calling, and then to say, may a cult of God I fall so short. But you know what? It's built into his plan. It's called confession when we fall short. Amen? We get back up. God empowers us to do what human nature cannot do. That's the essence of the gospel. God bless you guys. Thank you so much, Tim. We appreciate it. And uh, working through all that with you, and although you weren't able to go on the centering prayer, I think we've got a pretty high chance someone's going to ask a question about it. <laughs> I think so. By the way, I did, I'm about to put up um, a, uh, a post on centering prayer on my own blog post. I've kind of added to the one. I put up on Catholic Answers just, a, a, oh gosh, maybe a couple of months ago if you want to check it out. It's called Is Centering Prayer Catholic? But at any rate, you know, I, I often, Father, when I'm preparing these talks and stuff, I, I, I like to go through bullet uh, sort of, you know, points in, in my notes and stuff. And, and I always get more uh, ambitious <laughs> than time allows. But I hope you got the sense of, of what I was getting at here. You know, just the age-old deception of the devil who wants us to turn, in, in whatever way he can, to turn us away from our ultimate source, who is God, and of course, the God-man, Jesus Christ, to get turned in on ourselves, my friend. It leads to, you know what, Father, it leads to this, this emphasis on the self can lead to this awful place that St. Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12 where he says, if any man think he stand, <laughs> right? Brandon, remember that one? If any man think he stand, take heed lest he fall. When you get in that place where you say, man, look at me, Jack, I am there. I am so good. God has just blessed me. So, oh man, you are in the worst place you can be in as a Christian. Because when you start getting full of yourself, just ebbing God out ever so slightly, that's when you're going to fall. And in his mercy, God allows us to fall so that we will wake up from our insanity and acknowledge our absolute need for him. We'll start off with uh, this question, Tim. It's written in by um, Laura. And she says, well, given this fact that we're in this world of me, now um, are there sort of some particular techniques that you would recommend in sort of presenting the faith um, in this particular dynamic right right um, I tell you I, I'm not exactly sure where the, the where the question is coming from are you talking about presenting the faith to those outside of the church presenting the faith to those inside of the church that are, that are struggling with the sort of meism. Yes. Okay. Okay. I see what you're saying. Um, it seems from what I'm reading in this question, um, I would assume the question is, is addressed to those who are outside the church and kind of already eaten up this worldview of me, 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 me. Yes. Um, oh, great. That. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That, that, that helps me greatly. Well, folks, I will tell you, I'm going to tell you a little story. Years ago, when I was in the Marine Corps, in fact, 
I had a roommate, a roommate. I'll call him Bob. That's not his real name. Um, great guy. He was actually involved in a cult called The Way International. If any of you guys have ever heard of The Way International, it was a former Church of Christ minister named uh, Paul Victor Weirwill. Paul Victor or Victor Paul, I forget, but um, it's been a long time since I read his stuff. But he was a Church of Christ minister who founded this church. It's basically an antinomian sect, denies the divinity of Christ. And I will never forget this. This is a great line from my buddy Bob when I encountered him. And we used to argue about the divinity of Christ and, and such. And you talk about, about a guy that was wrapped up in the meism of our time. Well, Weirwill's church, I put that in quotation marks because, of course, it's not a church. I, I wouldn't even call it an ecclesial community. You know, I mean, it was it's antinomian. I mean, this, this uh, theology, if you will, was such that he, Bob could say to me one day, I remember he said, I've never had so much sex as when I became Christian. Okay, just to give you a sense of where, and with, you know, different partners. Okay, so this is, this is a sort of extremist, antinomian group, once saved, always saved, you accept Christ. I think Weirwill was kind of reacting against, you know, some of the extremes in the Church of Christ that he came from, where, you know, they were the only ones saved, you had to be baptized by them, you have to be dunked, it can't, you know, in fact, the, the, the thing about the Church of Christ uh, that Weirwill came from is, they say, now there, there are lots of different Churches of Christ, unfortunately, but the the hardcore Church of Christ that from Texas uh, teaches that, you know, infant baptism is invalid. You have to be dunked as an adult. But you, you also cannot believe in baptismal regeneration or that baptism has anything to do with your salvation. So there goes the Lutherans. There goes a whole... I mean, basically, the, the Church of Christ... Was, was saying that unless you're baptized by them, you, you, you're not going to heaven. They, they deny original sin. They're, it's all sorts of things. All right. So he kind of reacted against that, and he creates this church that basically takes what we just had in our reading this weekend, you know, in, in the liturgy, that anyone who says Jesus is Lord, right, no, or no man can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, Right. You take that text out of context and make that the end-all, be-all of the gospel. That's what they did. You acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord. You're saved. You're going to heaven. You can do whatever you, you, can do whatever you want. I mean, extreme sort of once saved, always saved. All right, are you with me? So, you know, I, you know, he and I were going at it, and for a year straight, we went at it over the gospel. And at the end of that year, or actually, no, it'll have been more like about eight months. Let me correct that. But at the end of the eight months, I got orders and I was getting ready to go to my duty station. And I'll never forget when Dave said this. He said, Tim, I have watched you over these last eight months. And he said, I know you think you weren't getting through to me at all, but you were. He said, I have watched you. And I've never seen somebody live the way you live. He said, I want that. Can I go to church with you this Sunday? And I kid you not, that's what he said. Now, I'm not saying this to toot my horn because I am the chiefest of sinners, my friend, in desperate need of the grace of God. But by God's grace, somehow it got through to this guy. And the reason why I say this is because there are folks so steeped in the meism of this generation, whether they are, you know, sons and daughters of the Reformation, of the Enlightenment, or of the popular culture, which also we didn't even get to touch on, folks. We are at the very end, I believe, in our, in our culture today. We are at the end of the road that begins with that little tweak during the Renaissance, which some would argue it's more than just a little tweak, of putting man in the center, 
on steroids with the Reformation, the Enlightenment to, to today, we have a genuinely narcissistic, narcissistic culture to a degree in Western civilization that I don't believe the planet has ever seen. That's in my humble opinion, I don't believe the planet has ever seen this level of narcissism. But what, what folks, I can't emphasize this much, enough. What Bob needed was not just a lecture and Bible verses. He needed to see Jesus Christ incarnate in me. And that is ultimately what brought him to the church. See, and I, I, I believe, folks, that we're in a culture that is, in, you know, Kimberly Hahn famously says, and she said it many times, and I love it. She said, we will change this world one diaper at a time. I love that. I love that line. We will change the world one diaper at a time. My wife says, amen to that. With seven kids, seven kids she's changed thousands as I have uh, of diapers. But I would say, yeah, there's a profound truth there. We will change the world one family at a time, ultimately one person at a time. But we will change the world when they see in us the love that they desire. Because, yes, our hearts are restless. You've made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. That is a profound truth, and the world knows it. They know it intuitively. I was recently at a, at a jewelry store to buy my wife a, a necklace um, for our anniversary. And I was waited on by this beautiful young African-American. She was probably th- not, actually, she was Jamaican. Um, and, and had the accent and oh, just a beautiful girl about probably I'm guessing 30, 32 in there. And, you know, as we're talking and, and we're wrapping things up and they literally gave the necklace over to the wrapping department, they were going to wrap it up in gift form. We started talking and she said, wow, you must really love your wife to buy her this gift. And I said, yes, I, I, I do. And she said, she said, can I ask, you know, how long have you been married? And I said, 18 years, and she went, what? She was, I mean, jaw hit the table, 18 18 years. And I'm thinking, my gosh, that's not very long, right? 18 years? You should come hang out with the people I hang out with. My parents were married 58 years before my dad just died two years ago. But anyway, I said 18, and she said, oh, my gosh, I don't know anybody that's been married that long. Do you have any kids? And I said, seven. (laughs) When I said seven, it was kind of like Maria in The Sound of Music. Remember that? When Mother Superior assigns uh, Maria to to go with the the Van the Von Trapp Von Trapp family, who have seven kids, and she says seven, right? And and Mother Superior says, "You like children, Maria?" And and she says, "Well, yes, but seven. <laughs> That's what this one seven. And I said, oh, yes. And we started talking. And she says, oh, my gosh, you've been married 18. You have seven kids. I don't know anybody like that. That's so beautiful. How do you do it? And I started to share with her. I kid you not. I started to share with her. I went back to, well, you know what? I said, the only way this happens is by the grace of God that works in my wife and my life. And really, it's, it's love. It's love that goes back to the creation itself. I mean, God, when God created, that was an infinite act of power in the creation. And you know, when God created, and I actually said to this right in the jewelry store, I said to her, you know, think about this. Why would God create when he's infinitely, absolutely happy from all eternity in the infinite, perfect circle of love, Father for the Son, Son for the Father, Father and Son for the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit for the Father and the Son. Why would he create? And in fact, when he created, not only did he know that that creation could not and would not add anything to him, but he knew that one day it would kill him. That creation would kill him in Jesus Christ, and yet he did it anyway. And I said to her, I, that, that's love. See, God did, he pours himself out into the other, the creation, without asking anything in return. And that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is just God doing what God does. He continues to pour himself out. Didn't we say it earlier in John 3, 16? For God so loved 
that he gave. He continues to love in the incarnation and then continuing to the cross and continuing to give himself to us in the Eucharist. So I was telling her, this is what love is. This is what my faith teaches me. And this is what Jesus empowers me to do. And I try as best I can. And I beg God for help is to pour myself out and love my wife without expecting anything in return. And those children of mine just love them till it hurts. And I kid you not, she began to cry. Here we are sitting in a jewelry store in the middle of San Diego, and she begins to cry, and she says, oh, my word. She says, that's the opposite of everything I've been taught in school. I've been, I kid you not, guys, I'm not making this up. She said, I've been taught in school that if I want to love anybody, I first have to love myself. And I can't love anybody until I first take care of myself. And I said, you know what? That is a lie. That is just not true. In fact, Pope St. John Paul the Great said, man cannot find himself until he gives the perfect gift of self. Until you love somebody. Are you kidding? You got to pour yourself out to the other because that's what love is. And you discover what love is in the process of dying to yourself. And folks, this is what the world needs to see. This they have, folks, I believe they have to see it. And this is why God has given us in our generation some of the greatest visible incarnations of the love of Jesus. In our generation, we lived and saw Pope St. John Paul the Great, who lived the crucifix for 20 years, his last, what, Five, ten years, he should have been in a hospital bed. And he's clinging to the crucifix, pouring himself out even unto death. That's John Paul. We lived it with Mother Teresa, who was going out into the streets of Calcutta and picking up bodies when she should have been in a hospital with an enlarged heart. She should have died. But she was pouring. I, you know, I'm, I'm, forgive me for being overly dramatic here. But the bottom line is... Folks aren't going to believe it until they see it. I think in this generation where they are so cynical, we have young people who are so cynical. They have hard hearts. They've accepted the lies of the culture to such a degree that many of them don't even believe in love. I believe they will believe when they see it. Thank you, Tim. We'll, ha- we'll end with this one question. It's a combination of uh, Mark and then my screen's just freezing up here, so I can't see it. Another person was writing in, and they're asking about the centering prayer uh, and kind of a two-part thing. One is, um, <clears throat> just briefly, what are, what's wrong about it? And then how is it distinct from the Jesus prayer in the East? Yes. Okay. Very good. Well, ultimately, as I, as I point out in my article at Catholic.com, is Centering Prayer Catholic? At its core, uh, Centering Prayer does the opposite of what true prayer calls us to. Because true prayer means not simply going inside, and this is the, the problem, turning in on the self to discover that we are God. In the first part of my article, I, I make this, this point that um, there's a, a, a book by the, the founder, Father Keating, who was kind of known as the father of the uh, Centering Prayer Movement. In his book, Open Heart, Open Mind, uh, he, he basically says this. And in my article, I actually have a link you can, qu- you can click on and see him actually make this statement, where Father Keating says this. In the spiritual life, there are three stages, he says. The first stage is to acknowledge that there is an other, right? Hey, this is good. Amen. Yes. First stage, to acknowledge there is an other. Second stage, to acknowledge that we desire unity with the other. Amen. Praise God. Yes, we're, 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 we're with you. But then he says the third stage is where you discover there is no other. But the other and you are one. There is no other. See, this is the grave error. I believe that, you know, Father Keating 
and the, the other leaders in the movement are teaching a kind of monism that's condemned by the Vatican, Vatican Council I. I love the image, you know, in Revelation 2.17, which, by the way, the church uses in the catechism of the Catholic Church to this end. In order, it, you know, uh, in Revelation 2.17, the scripture says when you and I get to heaven, that Jesus will personally give us each a little stone. The Greek, the Greek word is psephos, psephos there. And Pseiphos was a little white stone. It was actually, they were actually used in things like voting and whatnot, these little, little stones like this, or even in casting lots and, and, and that sort of thing. It's called Pseiphos. It says that Jesus will give us each one of these little stones with a name written on it that only you and God will know. Isn't that cool? Now, of course, this is not literal, folks. We're not actually going to get little stones. Hey, I want my stone. Where's my name? No, this is a prophetic. If you understand John the Apostle, who wrote the book of Revelation on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John, in his gospel, as well as in his three letters, and yes, I do believe he wrote all three of them, um, and the book of Revelation, you know, one of the things that John combats throughout is the error of some of the fathers of Gnosticism. In fact, St. Irenaeus tells us that Serenthus, the fame, I'm sure, Father, you've heard that name, Serenthus, he was one of the fathers of Gnosticism, who was first a follower of St. John, who left, and was evidently a very charismatic teacher, and led a lot of people away from, from Christ. But one of the many things that he taught was, you know, denied the individual, you know, individual, when, when we die, we're swallowed up in the noose, you know, there's no individuality uh, the, on the other side of the veil. And so, you know, some scholars believe, in fact, you'll see in Catholic commentaries that John is saying this in order to emphasize the fact that we will forever, Revelation chapter 5, 13, when it has the, the you know, the blessed in heaven worshiping the Father and the Son, all power and honor and glory is yours. The one thing you know is God is God and they are not. Amen? And there will be, and I know some in Eastern mystical traditions, you know, can tend in this way, uh, not, not in a true Catholic sense. Folks, heaven does not mean we lose our individuality and we lose our capacity to know. In fact, as Thomas Aquinas says, when we attain to the beatific vision of God, we will see God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in that, and by the way, the catechism teaches this as well, it is in that possession of God of the beatific vision that we will know the entire created order. Guys, we'll make Einstein look like an idiot, right? We will know the entire created order, God's entire plan of salvation. We will know how Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good. We will know it. We will know moms that have lost babies two weeks old will know precisely why, how that fit into God's plan of salvation. We will know the entire created order. Why? Thomas Aquinas says, if you possess God in the beatific vision, are you kidding me? The whole created order is like two plus two equals four. Are you with me? And so I say all that to say this. Folks, we must run in the other direction from any spirituality that loses our individuality in some pseudo-spirituality, number one. And number two, when centering prayer has as its goal, it becomes what, you know, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, I believe it's paragraph 2000, ah, I want to say 700, and 26, right around there, the catechism lists as an errant form of prayer, a form of prayer like TM that has as its focus the elimination of all thought, which is, again, this is the the way, principal way that union is attained in the centering prayer movement. It's much more Buddhist than it is Christian because it's in the emptying of all thought, even thoughts of love, Trinity, goodness, beauty must go. And the goal is this sort of, you know, I would argue, I mean, 
Folks, this is so contrary to Christianity when you understand we are a religion of the word. To try to eliminate all thought is to eliminate the word. Amen. And that's our salvation. The word was made flesh. There is no other way to the Father except through the word. This is why Paul says in, you know, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, if they're, you know, of a good report, if there be any virtue, any praise, think on these things. We meditate on the word. And in the Jesus prayer, yes, we meditate on Jesus. Even if it's one word, we're not emptying ourselves, attempting to make ourselves void of all thought, even of the good and the beautiful and the true which is what centering prayer does at its core. My friends, this is contrary to Christian spirituality, my friends. Any spirituality that attempts to empty. And if you read Father Keating, you read, I mean, you're basically focusing, your focus becomes on yourself because what you have to do, he he famously, you know, as as, uh, Father Pennington, one of his disciples, I think it was he who said, uh, in, in, in the process of real, realizing your, your divinity, 10,000 thoughts are 10,000 opportunities to come back to God. Did you hear that? Folks, that's not Christian. And remember, these are good thoughts, beautiful thoughts, true thoughts, or evil. It doesn't matter. My friends, that's Buddhist. That's not Christian. Because when we meditate, whether it's the Jesus prayer or Lexio Divina, we take a word of scripture, or even just Jesus, just saying the name Jesus, we're saying over and over, we are not emptying ourselves of all thought, even of Jesus. That's absolutely contrary to the Christian faith. At any rate, there's more I could say there, but I'll, I'll leave you with this third point, and I know we're, we probably have to go. I wish we could hang out longer, to be honest with you, because I feel like we're just getting started. But any, you know, sort of meditation that turns in on itself. Now, look, you know, Jesus said, the kingdom's not here, there. The kingdom of God is within you. Amen. God is, in fact, in us, and there is something to be said for even in the midst of prayer, reflect examination of conscience, reflecting on our, our, our sinfulness as well as God's goodness and how God has blessed us. All of that is, is beautiful and, and true. But when it has as its end turning in on the self in order to realize that you're God, no, because true prayer ultimately must be ordered outside of the self to the God who is able to heal the self and to transform the self into Jesus Christ. So, you know, the the navel gazing, the idea of just turning on yourself and, oh, I had a thought, that's bad. Okay, get rid of that thought. What are you doing? You're you're turning prayer into yourself. And and that's what the catechism is talking about in paragraph 27, 26. I think it's 27, 26. That comes to mind. But if you look in the catechism under erroneous uh, concepts, oh, it is there? Okay. It's there in 2726, the idea of emptying the mind to where it becomes a mental void. That is not prayer. That's a technique, (laughs) right? It's not prayer at all because prayer ultimately is a conversation, a, a communion. You don't have to say words all the time. I'm not saying that. I mean, there are times I, I, I like to sit on my back porch with my wife. We just have a couple glasses of wine and just sit. And I'm in heaven. I would like to just stay there. In fact, just the other night, we, we, we did that on our back porch. All the kids were asleep. Oh, my gosh. And I said, this is heaven. This is heaven. Can we just stop time right now? <laughs> right? All the kids were asleep. And we're just, look, when you love somebody, you don't have to be speaking all the time. But my friends, can you imagine being with your wife or your spouse and then thinking about yourself, right? Thinking about how, oh boy, I shouldn't have that thought. I should, oh, no, I got it. Then you're not in a communion with another. Amen? Well, guess what? Of course not in centering prayer because there is no other ultimately. And that's what you're trying to realize. That's not Christian. Excellent. Thank you, Tim. We appreciate it. 
and the uh, generosity of your time with us, we, and, and, and the rigor and everything.